Hello, this is the travelballdad.com. I have a pretty cool guest today, Hannah Thurley, uh, the mental skills coach for the Philadelphia Phillies, a recent uh, uh, addition to the team up in Philly. Welcome, Hannah. Hi, thank you. Excited to be here. Yes, ma'am. Well, thanks for joining us. She's in Nashville today, but uh, once the season begins, I'm sure she'll be uh, traversing the, the skies pretty regularly. But uh, Hannah, what we want to do today on the travelballdad.com is gain an understanding as to what you're seeing at the big league level as, as it pertains to mental skills, how to sharpen them, um, where there may be areas of lacking those skills, um, and how we can apply those, those areas and, and areas to improve at the younger level. Um, so can you do me a favor and kind of give us a background as to how you got to this point? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am, like you said, I'm currently in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and I was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I played sports my entire life, um, from everything from cheerleading to basketball, um, so and everything in between, um, and ended up uh, going to the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, where I played basketball and softball there, um, finished my career playing softball, and then um, got accepted into the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and went up there and got my master's, um, my master's degree in science with a concentration in sports psychology and motor behavior. Um, it was interesting because I knew I, I knew I knew I had to stay in sports. Um, I couldn't imagine my everyday life not being around sports. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of finding what was the niche that I was going to go with. Um, and I, I did a lot of research, found sports psychology, went to UT, um, had an amazing experience there. It's a very applied program. So I did a lot of hands-on work. Um, I did an internship at a junior golf academy. Um, I went and worked with the Pirates for a little bit um, and worked with the student athletes at the University of Tennessee in their um, mentor program. So it was a lot of school-based stuff, but it was neat to see how the sports psychology um, foundation kind of transferred over into the school also and into academics and into people's real lives outside of sports. Mm -hmm. um, and then I graduated, went straight with to the Pirates. Um, I was with the Pittsburgh Pirates for um, the short season team. So I was there about four months in Bradenton, Florida. Um, and then after that, I got a full-time position in New York City, um, working for a private practice called Sports Strata. Um, and we worked with athletes and people of all different kinds. Um, we worked with anywhere from like 10 year olds to um, 60 year old VPs of companies. So really expanded my horizon there um, and working with all different kinds of people. And recently um, got hired by the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, I guess it's been um, about a month ago I got hired and I am prepping. Um, I am going to move down to Clearwater, Florida. That's where they host their spring training um, on February 1st. Uh, and most of my time will be spent there but I'll be doing a lot of traveling throughout the system also and working predominantly with all the different minor league teams and occasionally I think helping with the big leaguers. So we'll see how that goes. Well, that makes a lot of sense working with the minor league guys and some of the big leaguers as well, give them the tools to be successful so they can take that to the big leagues, right? Build a Absolutely. foundation to grow. Yeah, well, that, That's a pretty cool uh, resume as to how you got to this point. Yeah. Um, so I guess what we would do is, is kind of apply what you, what you did at Strata. Is it Strata? Sports strata. Mm -hmm. Sports strata. Yep. Uh, as well as your time with the Pirates and, and, and especially the, the time at all the other gigs. And what are you seeing from, a, from a, an athlete at a high level, whether it's professional or college, um, some of the skills that uh, need work, right? Where, where were you able to, to most help those athletes in having success? Yeah, so... I think one of the biggest areas um, that I work with is by the time you're into professional sports, um, you've heard of sports psychology um, and you know that you should be training the mind and the, and the people who are playing in the major leagues and who have made it to the top already do that. And so there's a lot of, even though it's all professional baseball, right? There's a wide range from rookie guys first year to guys who have been in the league for 13, 14 years. Um, and so it's kind of figuring out where they are 
Um, and my base foundation all surrounds around awareness. Um, I'm a firm believer that we can't grow if we don't know, you know, if we don't know where you are, or what needs help or what needs work on any parts of your game, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever, if we don't know where you are, there's, we don't know where we need to go. Um, a lot of athletes are like, well, I want to play in the major leagues. Well, everybody wants to play in the major leagues. Right. And so it's like, where are you right now? in correlation to the major leagues and where do we need to go? What are the steps we need to take in order to get you there? And what are some of the roadblocks that you might face? Um, who are the people that are going to help support you get to that end goal where you want to be? Um, and really helping them become aware of, is this real? Is this a possibility? You know, that's a, that's a hard conversation to have with athletes too, but I've had a couple of those and, and knowing what's after this, you know, because, even if you're the best of the best, you're not going to play for forever. As we just saw Derek Jeter retired, you know, you can't play forever. So what, is, what are you going to do after that too is an important conversation also. But I think everything stems from awareness um, because a lot of guys think they're ready to play in the major leagues right now and they're not. And a lot of guys don't know that they're that close to playing in the major leagues and they are. So I, I think, I think a, lot of, a lot of it revolves around awareness and just figuring out where you are, where you want to go and how, do, how the heck do we get there and who can help and – what do we need to do in order to get you to be the best you can be? And specifically, my role is on the mental side of that. You know, I never thought about it from an awareness perspective, um, mm -hmm. almost an awareness of preparation. Uh, Absolutely. If you look at it that way, just from uh, you get some, maybe they don't know they're ready for, or they're on the doorstep of the big leagues. How do you, how do you prepare for that to, to, to go into that, mm -hmm. that type of job as well as the big leaguer that's on his way out? Um, how do they prepare for life after baseball? And that's whether it's uh, playing in the major leagues or umpiring or whatever it might be, change happens, right? Um, and how do you deal with that after the fact? And that, that can be an emotional toll, as I'm sure that you've seen firsthand. Yeah, very, very emotional. Those conversations transitioning out are, nobody wants to have that conversation, but it, sometimes it's the conversation that needs to be had. And sometimes we're the go-to person, you know, of well, just like support, who's supported us through all this and who's going to support us after all this too, you know, and, and knowing that people are there for you as a person and not you as an athlete. I think that's a big thing too, is differentiating that um, just it doesn't matter how good of a baseball player you are or you aren't. That doesn't define who you are as a man or a woman. You know, it's like that those two are totally inseparable or separable because a lot of people don't think that a lot of people like I didn't play good. I'm a horrible person, you know? And so a lot of differentiating between that and what is actually going on and happening and what their perspective of it is. Um, and also and the, uh, something I don't want to leave out is the enjoyment factor. You know, once you get to this level, um, I would say it's more challenging to enjoy what you do um, because all of a sudden it's money, it's your job, um, you have to do it to support your family. Maybe you're from the Dominican Republic and your family's living off of what you're making. You know, there's a lot of sacrifices that go into it. Um, so, but all the studies show that if you enjoy it, you play better. And so it's like, how do we help you to enjoy the sport that you once loved, right? And played as a little kid. How do we find that little boy love and passion? Um, because not only will that help you play better, but that'll actually help you like enjoy life. And, and you know, how do we do that? And it seems like an easy thing to do. I'll just go out there and have fun. But sometimes it's very, very challenging for these guys to go out there and have fun when this is job, this, they have to perform, they have to do well, you know, all of these. Hannah, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head. And I think that can be applied at every level. For example, at the big league level, it does turn into a job. And sometimes uh, you're more concerned and not to their fault, but, you do get caught up into, Hey, I, I got to have these numbers to make this amount because I, I need to support this, this, and this. And it's hard not to think about it from a business perspective. And that's what you do. That's why it's so critical for what you do to help them understand if you enjoy better, you play better. Therefore you might make more money possibly or play longer. Uh, so there's numerous benefits to enjoying it aside from enjoying it. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that's pretty cool. But I can also apply, at the youth levels, you know, we see all these travel ball teams, these high school teams, and the Holy Grail is that D1 scholarship, right? Or getting drafted. And they put yeah. so much pressure on themselves to perform. And they feel that if they didn't hit, go four for four and hit two bombs, that it was a failure that day. Mm -hmm. And they put so much pressure on themselves. And, and it's unfortunate because I see it. They, they don't enjoy it as much as they, as I think they should. 
just totally. play the game, right? Whether it's baseball, basketball, football, whatever, enjoy what you're doing and don't put so much pressure on yourself because there is life after sport. Yeah. So, so that, that is something that, uh, I don't know if you see that same trend happening at, at the youth levels and how much you work with those youth players, but, um, for someone that has a challenge with, with, with that as a youth player, as far as, uh, enjoying the game, what, what would you recommend they do? Good question. Well, they're, well, they're more concerned, they're more concerned with the results. And mm -hmm. if they didn't go four for four, then they're a failure. How would you recommend they rectify that? Yeah, great question. Um, probably one of the number one questions I get, especially from parents. Um, and a lot of the times, as much as the parents don't want to hear this, it kind of falls back on them and, and the standards that they're setting for their kids. Um, it's, it's, to be totally honest, sometimes it's harder to talk to the parents than it is to talk to the kids because these parents are like, we have to do this. We have to get this Division One scholarship. And like sometimes the, person, the kid in front of you isn't a D1 player. And that's okay. Um, but no, I think... I think this question could go a lot of different ways. Um, you know, being very outcome focused is not what we want at all. You know, we want to focus on the process. And I think you're right. I have seen the trend, you know, when I was in high school, which wasn't that long ago, um, I was like getting recruited like sophomore, junior year, which is, was, was about right. You know, that's when you kind of hit your peak and then your senior year, you're kind of more relaxed and can go play wherever you want to play. Um, and actually try to enjoy it a little more now that the burden's off of you. But now it's like seventh and eighth grade and like before these girls and boys have even matured and like all of this stuff. And so I think it's sad kind of, you know, because like it's going all the way back and you are, it's like compete, 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 even from like T-ball, like you're competing if your kid's not the fastest or something. Um, they've got so, rankings. They've got rankings on the best yeah. fifth grader yeah. across the country. Right. Oh, and it, it yeah. gets earlier and earlier because the coaches are, you know, and, and, inherently these college coaches are paid a lot of money and there's a lot of pressure on them to perform mm -hmm. and they I, I get it. they want to get that advantage they want to get in front of the kid as soon as possible so it's not their fault by any means it's just the way the system has evolved and right um it is what it is yeah no i and and to some extent that can't be ignored, you know, like there's a fifth grade rankings, like as a parent, you're probably going to go on and see where your kid is ranked, you know, but maybe that's something that, that the kid shouldn't see, or maybe that's something that if the kid does see, you have a sit down conversation and you're like, we're not going to look at this again. We're going to look at this one time. If you have to look at it, right. Which I understand that too. So it's a balance, right? So if you have to look at it and you really want to see where you're at, maybe that's the starting point. Maybe that's the awareness. Okay. You're at the top. Great. Here's where we want to go. Okay. You're at the bottom. You're not where you wanted to be. What do we need to do to get to the top? And also we're not looking at this again because you are so focused on the outcome that if we're only focusing on winning or hitting home runs or whatever this, whatever you're focused on, you're not going to focus on the process of how do we get there, right? A lot of sports psychology and what we teach is very surface level. It's all the what, right? We want to hit home runs. We want to be confident. We, um, we want to be the best player. We want to go division one, but nobody talks about how do we do it or why do we do it, Right how do you become a division one athlete and why do you have to become an, a division one athlete? A lot of times when I ask the why they're like, I don't really know why everybody's doing it. Right. And it's like, maybe that's not even where you need to go. Like maybe you would just flourish at a D two school. Like there's nothing wrong, you know? And so mm -hmm. I think it's important to have that conversation of ask your kid, why is it so important to win? Well, because I don't want to lose. Well, why do you not want to lose? Well, because it's embarrassing to lose. Well, and then, and then you could even get into a conversation of if we won all the time in sports, would it even be fun? And sometimes when you get into really young ages, they can't quite understand that concept yet um, because they're like, yeah, I want to win all the time. But for your really competitive athletes, you know, and kids who are growing, and I think this is a good point to teach is if you won all the time, you wouldn't want to play anymore, right? The reason winning is fun is because there was a chance that you could have lost. They were a really, really good team and you were a really good team. And there was a solid chance that you could have lost, but we won, which makes winning so sweet. Mm -hmm. We also know that we could, we could lose because that's a game of baseball. We're constantly failing every at bat. There's a solid percent chance that you're going to fail. And so it's kind of, it's a great opportunity to teach these kids that you can fail and that's okay. Um, but the important part is that your process was exactly what you wanted it to be. You saw the pitch, you, you checked out the pitcher before you knew a pitch was coming or you, you thought you knew a pitch were coming. You were as prepared as you possibly can. And then it's, if you strike out, that's just the outcome, you know, or if like, 
people always say they want to win. They want to win. They want to win. They want to win. Can you alone win a game? And it's like, absolutely not. And I ask, I ask athletes all the time, have you ever played really, really good and lost? And everyone's like, well, yeah. And have you ever played really, really bad and still won? And they're like, well, yeah. And so it's like, it's not even winning. It's like not, you, you can't predict if you're going to win or lose, but you can predict how you set yourself up for as close to success as you can get. But a lot of the things are out of our control. And I think that's it even goes into a whole nother conversation, but it's like, is what you're frustrating about in your control or not in your control? You know, you're mad you struck out. Well, did the pitcher pitch you a really freaking good pitch? Like sometimes, and guess what? Maybe the ump made a bad call, you know, like that happens too. Like, and sometimes it's for us, sometimes it's against us, but there's so much out of your control that you have to take a step back and say, is this something even worth getting mad about? Or is this something that there's absolutely no control about? You know, it was in the dirt and the ump called a strike and there's nothing we can do about that. I could turn around and yell at him, but that's not really going to do any good, you Mm -hmm. know? And so can I control it? Can I not? And is this process or is this outcome focused? Because we obviously want to focus on the things that we can control, which there's not a whole lot that we can actually control in the game of sports when you start to think about it. Like you can't control like almost, you can't control your team. All you can control is you. And sometimes you can't even control some of your factors. Sometimes you're really tired. And so you can't perform to your best. Sometimes you're stuck in a fog. Sometimes you don't feel good. Sometimes you didn't get a good night's sleep or you didn't eat. Right. So there's so many things that are outside of our control that most of the things we get really worked up on, we realize we really didn't even have control over. And so I think that's a good question to always come back and be like, could you control that? Could you control if the team won or not? No, most of the time it's no. Could you have helped maybe or something? There's something you could have done. But I think that's an important question that we should be asking the athletes and athletes we should be asking ourselves too. That's awesome, Hannah. That's a wonderful answer to that question. Um, At the professional level, Mm-hmm. Sports psychology has been isn't something that's happened overnight, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. It, how far back would you go where you say uh, at the professional level teams have embraced sports psychology? Is is it a, a fifteen years? Is it thirty years? Is it fifty years? How far back has it become a mainstay in professional sports? Um. So you have people like Harvey Dorfman who were. I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I'd say 40 years ago, maybe who are starting to like introduce the concepts of like psychology translating into sport. Um, but then probably mainstream, I'd say, I'd say 20, I'd say 20 years ago, there was probably three or four guys in the field who were really doing good work in the MLB. Mm-hmm. And I would say in the last five years is when it really started to explode. And what I mean by that is, Now, I believe every major league team, every organization has to have some kind of a mental performance coach on staff. Um, And so that's different from a clinical psychologist, right, where who's working on, you know, depression or eating disorders or anxiety or things like that, of that nature, Um, all clinical based issues. And now mental performance coaching is basically solely focused on your performance and on field things through the lens of a mental, through the mental lens. Mm -hmm. Um, So um but now every team has to have that i think that happened two when i was with the pirates so two seasons ago that was a new rule um and now teams are getting more and more mental performance coaches for all the different levels of their team so now you'll see um an organization will have anywhere from one to six mental performance coaches on staff yeah and Mm -hmm. so i think that in 10 years you'll see that almost every different team for every organization will have a mental performance coach with them kind of like it's evolving a lot like the strength and conditioning coaches evolved so there was one strength and conditioning coach and now there's one at every single league so you have one at triple a double a high a low a short season teams and the big league like you've got everybody every every team has a strength and conditioning coach and i really think sports psych is going to be close behind it so i've been in five years and, and especially it's really cool because in all professional sports, I believe that Major League Baseball is the sport um, in the organization that has picked it up the most and really grasped onto it and realized how important it is and really bought into the concepts. Um, so, you know, the two, the two like assistant GMs that I've spoken to from both the Pirates and the Phillies are so bought in. It's incredible, you know, and, and how, can you, how can you not be? I mean, yeah. just from, uh, you know, if you've got happy player or not, happy, say happy, if you've got players that have an, an, an ability to, to, not fix. What am I trying to, 
if you help. give them the tools to be successful from a mental yeah. perspective, they're going to perform better on the field. So how can you not be excited about it? Totally. And I um, love how you said not fix because I'm constantly saying I'm here to help you. We're not, we're not fixing anything. So I think that's a, there's a lot of negative stigma that could come from mental performance coaching. You know, you only go see them when you're in a slump or when you're not doing well or when you had a really bad game or something like that. When the reality of it is, is we want to be as proactive as possible. So I, I, this story I always tell is the story of a dentist, you know, before everybody realized they needed to go to the dentist, they went to the dentist when their teeth were falling out, right? Hey, something's not right. Let's go to the dentist, right? My teeth are falling out. Where now it's like you have to go two or three times a year to do preventative and proactive work. And so your teeth don't fall out now. So it's not when crap hits the van that you all of a sudden have to go see us. It's actually like we're preparing you for all different kinds of things that happen. So when it does happen on the field, 